Okay, we're back for our final hour here for this afternoon. And in this final hour, I'd like to cover as much as we can having to do with high temperature effects and hypersonic flows. Before I do this, uh, I, I ought to make a sort of a generalized comment so that we can uh, uh, get a proper perspective on things. Uh, I'm going to put on the overhead camera again this book that we've been looking at. Uh, and just, uh, I'll say again, if you feel like things have been going by fairly fast and if you're kind of questioning what is this still all about, uh, if you feel a little bit blown out of the water, uh, I'll say again, I think that's quite natural because uh, at the University of Maryland, uh, we use this book for a one-year course, a uh, one-semester course on hypersonic flow and a one-semester course on high-temperature gas dynamics. And so here we are attempting to cover material in the space of five hours, which is norm normally takes a, a year at a graduate level to really get a strong feel for. So uh, what I'm saying is that, again, if you feel that uh, uh, a little bit blown out of the water, I think that's quite natural if you feel that way. But on the other hand, what I'm hoping is happening, and I'll repeat again what we're trying to accomplish here, is just some general thoughts and general ideas so that uh, uh, what, we're, what we've talked about today will help you to better understand the, some of the applications that will be talked about tomorrow. And once again, so that when you walk out the door at 5 o'clock tomorrow afternoon, you will just simply be a notch further ahead than you were when you first walked in the door this morning in terms of being better able to understand the hypersonic literature, the be a better able to talk with your colleagues in the area of hypersonics, just better able to understand maybe some of the words in the nomenclature. Okay, now with all of that in mind, let's uh, finish up a little bit on, uh, at least fairly quickly here, in terms of our basic physical chemistry. Uh, I want to go through another thought experiment. The, let's take the air in this room. Let's heat it up to 5,000 degrees Kelvin and at one atmosphere. Question, what are the thermodynamic properties at one atmosphere at, and at uh, 5,000 Kelvin? How do we calculate, for example, how do we calculate the internal energy or the enthalpy of the air at one atmosphere and at 5,000 K? How would you get a handle on that number? And hopefully in about two or three minutes, let me show you how to get a handle on that number. First, we have to, we do recognize that at 5,000 K, if we go back to our little diagram that we had here, if I can find it, the, uh, well, we, we do recognize that, uh, see, it all starts looking the same here. The, we do recognize that we're going to have dissociation of nitrogen and of oxygen. 5,000 Kelvin, one atmosphere. Now, how do we, uh, the calculation of the enthalpy of the internal energy under those conditions requires two pieces of information. One piece is, what in the world are the thermodynamic properties, we'll say the internal energy of each individual chemical species, just of O2 or N2 or atomic oxygen or atomic nitrogen? What are the species, what are the thermodynamic properties of just those individual species? Second question. How much of each species do you have present in the mixture? And then if you have the answers to those two questions, then you can put those two together and calculate the internal energy of the gas mixture at 5,000 K in one atmosphere. <laughs> Let's see how that's done. Without going into any of the details of the mathematical considerations, I'm going to give you the answer. On page 440, I've been told to use the AIAA pen here, so we will use the AIAA <laughs> pen for a pointer. Uh, if we have atoms, the internal energy of an atom, of an atomic species, say per unit mass, is the translational energy plus the electronic energy. There's nothing there to rotate. There's nothing there to vibrate. We have just translational and electronic energies. If we have molecules, the internal energy is the translational energy, and that's 3 halves RT that comes out of our considerations dealing with a Boltzmann distribution and a gas in equilibrium. RT is the rotational energy. Then we have a term for the vibrational energy, is this term here. And notice that it has an H nu over KT. It's an exponential term. And then our electronic energy. This is what the individual, for a given species like diatomic oxygen, 
This represents the internal energy of diatomic oxygen. Okay, now let's look at the specific heats. The, the specific heats are the derivatives, like C sub V is the partial V respect to T at constant volume. We get three halves R for, plus the electronic contribution for an atom. For molecules, three halves R plus R plus this term for the vibration plus the electronic energy. This is due to our translational motion. Let me identify that. <clears throat> this is due to translation. This is due to rotation. This is our vibrational contribution, and of course, this is our electronic contribution. <clears throat> now, right here on this piece of paper, I'm going to quickly do a, a, a go through a little exercise. Let's take the air in this room. Well, let's, let's even back up. Let's take a gas mixture where only the translational energy and the rotational energy are present. That would tell us, if that's true, that would tell us that C sub V is equal to 5 halves R. Okay? Now, there is a thermodynamic relation that says that Cp, the specific heat of constant uh, pressure, is equal to C sub V plus R. So if we only had translational motion and rotational motion in our gas, then C sub P would equal 7 halves R. Now, let me divide these two. Cp over C sub V. 7 halves R over 5 halves R. Or Cp over C sub V is 7 fifths or 1.4. Now, does that 1.4 grab you in any way? <laughs> of course, that's the ratio of specific heats for the air in this room. And that's what we use for 90% of all aerodynamic, high-speed aerodynamic compressible flow problems. We deal with a ratio of specific heats, 1.4 for air. And what is this telling us? That's telling us that for the air in this room, the air in this room just you know, just has translational and rotational energy. And for the air in this room, the vibrational energy is insignificant. Okay, one other thought. We defined earlier a thermally, per a calorically perfect gas is one, a calorically perfect gas, one with constant specific heats. And that's what we're talking about here. These specific heats are constant. They're not a function of temperature. Look at this. Specific heat is 5 halves R or 7 halves R. That's not a function of temperature. And gamma equals 1.4. That's a calorically perfect gas. We define a thermally perfect gas as one where the specific heats are a function of temperature. Specific heats now are variable, but they're a function of temperature only. Look at this. What makes the specific heat a function of temperature? It's the vibrational energy term. So when we take, when we take the gas in this room and we start heating it up, and we get up to about 800 to 900 degrees Kelvin, where the vibrational energy starts coming into play, suddenly the specific heats now start becoming a function of temperature. And this is why, because of the vibrational energy term. Now, <coughs> This is how you can calculate the internal energy of individual chemical species. So if we take the air in this room, we zap it up to 5,000 K, this tells us what the individual internal energies are of each one of the individual species. Now the next question, the second question we ask is, how much of each individual species do we have present in the mixture? Now the answer to that involves something that's called a chemical equilibrium calculation. That's outlined in your, in, your, in your book, those of you who have the book again. And simply let me, let me make the following statement. The essence of a, chemi of a calculation of an equilibrium chemical composition involves something that's called an equilibrium constant. You'll find this on page 447, equation 1174. If we have a generic chemical reaction like species AB going into A plus B, if we have a mixture of these three species, we can define a partial pressure of each individual species in the mixture. And the ratio of these partial pressures, the products, these are called the products on the right-hand side of the reaction, on the left-hand side of the reactants, the ratio of the partial pressures of the products to the partial pressures of the reactants, in this case, is defined as the equilibrium constant. 
Let me take a time out for a minute. What's a partial pressure? <clears throat> Think about this for a minute. Here we have the air in this room. Th this is this is time out. Just a discussion on partial pressures. Uh, the the air in this room consists of about 80 percent nitrogen and 20 percent oxygen by volume. That means that 20 percent of the particles are oxygen, 80 percent are nitrogen. Now, <clears throat> the air in this room is at one atmosphere. Here we're sitting here. It's one atmosphere of pressure. Let me go out to Sears and Roebuck and buy a vacuum cleaner. And this is a very selective vacuum cleaner. It's, it vacuums up only oxygen molecules. So we bring it back into this room. We seal all the doors and windows. And we turn on this vacuum cleaner. We just vacuum up all the oxygen molecules. What do you think the pressure in this room is going to be? It's one atmosphere now. Before I turn the vacuum cleaner on, I turn the vacuum cleaner on. I suck up all the oxygen molecules. What's the pressure in this room going to be? Eight tenths of an atmosphere. And the only stuff that's left in this room is nitrogen. Presto, by definition, the partial pressure of nitrogen in this room is eight tenths of an atmosphere. It's the pressure that the nitrogen would exert if you had just the nitrogen in the room, but it occupied the entire volume of the gas. Same thing if I went to Montgomery Ward and bought another vacuum cleaner that just sucks up uh, nitrogen and come back here to the room replaced with air, turn it on, suck up all the nitrogen. What's the pressure going to be? Two tenths of an atmosphere because we just have oxygen left. And that, by definition, is a partial pressure of oxygen. When we're making calculations of equilibrium compositions in high temperature chemically reacting gases, the partial pressures are very convenient quantities to deal with. And there's a prescription for making such an equilibrium calculation that starts on page 449 which simply tells you uh, that if we have a system, and let's define a system, I'll define a system having to do with chemically reacting air. And I'm going to say that we have seven species present in this chemically reacting air at 5,000 5, K in one atmosphere. Those seven species are going to be oxygen, atomic, diatomic and atomic, diatomic nitrogen, atomic oxygen, nitric oxide, NO plus, and electrons. And we'll have seven species. Therefore, we can have seven partial pressures. And the sum of those partial pressures equals the pressure of the mixture. It's called Dalton's Law of Partial Pressure. Then we have some equilibrium constants we can use. And each one of these equilibrium constants correspond to different chemical reactions. I'll just write one down. For this reaction, for this equation, for example, we're looking at uh, diatomic oxygen dissociating into two oxygen atoms. And that says that the partial pressure of the oxygen squared, because we have two of these, divided by P sub O2 is by definition the equilibrium constant. We have a similar reaction here. This would give us N2 going into 2N. And this reaction here would be N plus O going into NO. And we have these various equilibrium constants. These equilibrium constants are known numbers. You can look them up in various reference sources. And so these represent four additional equations. In addition with this one, gives us five equations with seven unknowns. There's another constraint that has to be imposed. If we look on the next page, equation labeled Roman numeral six, we have to impose the constraint that the ratio of oxygen nuclei to nitrogen nuclei always stays the same. We're not dealing with any nuclear reactions here. They're all chemical reactions. And so there's a constraint that forms a a constraint on the ratios of the partial pressures constant being constituted of these oxygen and nitrogen nuclei. And then finally, if we have ionization, the partial pressure of the nitric oxide ions should be that of the electrons. So we now have seven equations with seven unknowns. Allows us to calculate for the partial pressures, and they will tell us then the com chemical composition of our chemical reacting mixture. So that's the answer to the second question. How do you find the chemical composition of the air at 5,000 K in one atmosphere. Typical results that you would see, by the way, for high temperature air are given in figure 1111. We'll take a look at that. This is a plot of the mole fraction of the chemical species as a function of temperature all at one atmosphere for high temperature air. Notice that if we start down here at low temperatures below 2,000, that virtually nothing is happening. But then if we go begin to get above 2,000, what's the first thing that happens? Dissociation of the oxygen. And look, 
our atomic oxygen starts skyrocketing, uh, skyrocketing here. As we go up above 4,000 K, we begin to see the dissociation of the nitrogen. And here our, di our atomic nitrogen really skyrockets up. So these are results of what are called equilibrium chemical composition calculations for high temperature air. So the answer to our question here, how much of each species is present at 5,000 K in one atmosphere, we, that answer is right here along this vertical line in the 5,000 K. We have this much N2, this much O, this much N, and so forth. Okay, so we put these two pieces of information together what the internal energy is of each species, along with the composition of the chemically reacting mixture. We add them to do together properly, and that's described in your book. I'm not going to go through that. And we get the equilibrium chemical th thermodynamic properties of our reacting gas. For gas and equilibrium. Now, let's ask the question, is the gas always in equilibrium? Let's go back to our example here, the air in this room. Let's heat it to 5,000 K. How do we heat it to 5,000 K? Maybe we can zap it with some laser beam that will selectively add energy to the gas instantaneously in zero time. And we heat the gas to 5,000 K in zero time. Now, do you think that all of a sudden the nitrogen and oxygen will be dissociated in that zero time? And the answer is no because it takes molecular collisions, of course, for these chemical reactions to take place, the molecular collisions take time to occur. And so what's going to happen after we zap the gas, the first few milliseconds, the chemical composition will, will change as a function of time. Here we are, we're sitting in this room with our thermal protection suits on at 5,000 K, and we're watching these chemical reactions take place, and it may take a few milliseconds. It may take a few milliseconds before we achieve the composition that is dictated on this graph. Now, what is happening during those first, through milli first few milliseconds is called a non-equilibrium situation. And the vibrational energy is changing as a function of time, and the chemical composition is changing as a function of time. That is a non-equilibrium situation. And there are ways of handling those non-equilibrium situations because there are equations that allow you to calculate the time rate of change of the vibrational energy. Let me show you one. We'll quickly hop over a lot of material here. There is an equation that allows you to calculate the time rate of change. This is on page 488. Equation number 1317 allows you to calculate the time rate of change of the vibrational energy and involves something called the vibrational relaxation time. There are equations that allow you to calculate the time rate of change of chemical species in a non-equilibrium gas. Let me show you what uh, one of those would look like. And uh, let me do it a little bit simpler. Let's say that we're looking at the dissociation of oxygen. This is the top of page 492. The dissociation of oxygen, O2 going into 2O. And it will go, that's called the forward direction for that reaction. The time rate of change of atomic oxygen due to that forward rate is given by something called a rate equation, where the concentrations, the moles per unit volume of the reactants, O2 and M as a collision partner, could be any of the other species in the mixture, are working to dissociate the oxygen at a certain rate, and this equation tells you the time rate of change of the concentration, the brackets, O, brackets, is, that's a chemical notation for concentration, moles per unit volume. Now, this equation can also take place in the backward rate or the reverse rate, and there would be a time rate of decrease of atomic oxygen due to that, and that's given by this expression. The concentration of O squared, the stoichiometric mole number, appears as an exponent, times the concentration of the, of the collision partners. And the net rate of change of the concentration, the net time rate of change of atomic oxygen is given by the forward rate minus the reverse rate, the backward rate. Now, in our thought experiment, we've zapped the gas in this room to 5,000 K at one atmosphere, and we're watching the oxygen concentrations change 
as a function of time over these first few milliseconds, there'll be so much change per second locally for the atomic oxygen. And this equation gives that to you, at least in principle, gives that to you. This is the type of equation that you use. It's called a chemical rate equation to calculate the non-equilibrium to calculate the non-equilibrium composition as a function of time in a non-equilibrium gas. Now, that is all I'm going to say really about our basic physical chemistry because we need to spend the next few minutes talking about actual flows. And so the next item will be the next item on our roadmap here. The next item is, we've now finished talking about basic physical chemistry. Let me say a few words about chemically reacting flows. Now, when we talk about chemically reacting flows, we have to ascertain whether the flow is in equilibrium or whether it's in non-equilibrium. The, in, in your book, there is a chapter, chapter 14, which deals with inviscid high temperature flows that are just in local equilibrium, where we're assuming that the reaction rates are fast enough, the collision frequencies are fast enough to always maintain local equilibrium properties throughout the flow field. On the back of that page, there's an actual definition that more precisely deals with this. If we, we can deal with a flow that is in local thermodynamic equilibrium, and what we're dealing with there is just we're saying, look, the gas has a local Boltzmann. The particles of the gas are distributed over the energy levels according to a local Boltzmann distribution of the temperature T. We can also define flow that is in local chemical equilibrium. Local chemical equilibrium. What that means is that at every point in the flow, the chemical composition is dictated by what we just talked about before, uh, by the equilibrium constants, by a local chemical equilibrium type uh, calculation. And so the we, we look at the properties of that gas locally in the flow as, as being in local chemical equilibrium at the local temperature and pressure of the gas. If we make that assumption, and we'll, in a minute, in a few minutes, I'll, I'll explain when you can make that as assumption. If you make that assumption, then you can calculate various types of flow fields assuming this local equal, these local equilibrium conditions. And let me show you one type of flow field that's particularly apropos to our hypersonic aerodynamics, and that's the flow through a shock wave, in particular the flow through a normal shock wave, which you can find on page 507. For a moment, let's just look at this problem. We have known conditions in front of the normal shock wave, and say it's hypersonic conditions, very fast velocity. <clears throat> we want to calculate the properties behind the shock wave. Temperature behind the shock will be very high. So we're going to have dissociation and maybe ionization of the gas. How do you calculate these properties? Well, the answer is given in your, in your book, and I'm not going to cover that. But the answer is it does involve numerical calculations. You always have to, there isn't a chemically reacting flow problem that I know of yet that you don't have to do numerically in some form or another. You don't have the luxury of nice, neat analytical equations. That luxury goes out the window. But let's take a look at some results for this normal shock case. What kind of results do we get? Let's look at figure 14.2. Figure 14.2 is a plot of the temperature ratio across a normal shock as a function of velocity in front of the shock. This dashed line is what you would calculate if you assumed a calorically perfect gas with gamma equals 1.4, this dashed line is what many of you probably learned to calculate for shock wave properties in an elementary course dealing with compressible flow. The dashed line is what you would get when you use the compressible flow tables like NACA 1135 or tables in the back of some compressible flow book. And this dashed line is totally wrong when you're dealing with high velocities and high temperatures because if we Look at a case where, say, the pressure in front of the normal shock is a tenth of an atmosphere. We see the actual temperature ratio is given by this, including all the chemically reacting effects. So what do we see? We see that the temperature is considerably smaller than that predicted by a calorically perfect gas. Why is it considerably smaller? 
Why is the temperature, when we turn the switch and allow chemical reactions, why is the temperature smaller behind the shock wave than if we assume a calorically perfect gas? Well, intuitively. Here, we have chemical reactions. What chemical reactions? The flow, the gas is dissociating. Dissocia a dissociation reaction is an endothermic reaction. It takes energy. So a lot of this kinetic energy that's going through the shock wave is showing up essentially in the chemical energy, we call it the zero point energy, of the atomic species. And it's not there to show up as internal energy in the gas and to give you a high temperature increase. And so what's happening here, there's a sink of energy, and so with the chemical reactions, the temperature behind the shock wave is lower. The moral to this story is, number one, if you don't make the, let's put this way, number one, temperatures are very high behind normal shock waves at high velocities. There's a temperature ratio of 50, that's a high temperature ratio. But secondly, if you don't make the calculation properly, you don't carry it out properly, taking into account the chemical reacting effects, you're going to miss by a huge amount the proper temperature behind the shock. It is important to take these chemical reacting effects into account when calculating flows across shock waves and hypersonic flows. Witness the pressure in front of the shock also makes a difference. As we reduce the pressure in front of the shock, the temperature ratio at any given velocity, the temperature ratio is reduced just simply by going to lower pressures in front of the shock. What's happening there? Well, we mentioned it a few minutes ago, pressure has an effect on dissociation. If you decrease the pressure, everything else being equal, you get more dissociation. Remember we said high pressure squeezes the dissociation out of the gas, low pressure allows dissociation to occur more readily. And so what's happening at these lower pressures, you're getting more dissociation behind the shock and therefore the temperature ratio is less. So this is physically what happens when you're dealing with a chemical reacting flow, an equilibrium flow across a shock wave. This has an effect, by the way. Let me show you that in, in your notes, there are other plots. Figure 14.3a on page 512 is a more detailed plot of the temperature behind normal shocks as a function of velocity for various different altitudes. This goes out to 22,000 feet per second. This plot is continued on the next page out to 46,000 feet per second. Those are temperatures. You also have density variations. Those, that's shown on page 514. This is a plot of the density ratio as a function of velocity. I want to point out something to you. For those of you who remember your, your supersonic aerodynamics, we had mentioned earlier uh, this morning, when we first looked at these, uh, these uh, hypersonic shockwave relationships, we found in the limiting case as the Mach number goes to infinity that the density ratio was gamma plus 1 over gamma minus 1. And for gamma equals 1.4, uh, this equals 6. So as you go to Mach number infinity, the density ratio approaches 6. But that's for a calorically perfect gas with gamma equals 1.4. Now, what's happening here? Look at these density ratios that are actually taking place in the chemical reacting flow behind a normal shock wave. Look at this. At 36,000 feet per second, which is the escape velocity from the Earth, that's the entry velocity of the Apollo capsule coming in from the Moon. And at about 300,000 feet, what kind of density ratio do we have? Man, it's 19. It's not 6, it's 19. The chemical reacting effects can have a tremendous influence on your density ratio through the temperature effects. Now, what does that do to you in terms of a gas dynamic problem? Let's think just for a moment about the flow field over a blunt nose body. Here's a blunt nose body, hypersonic flow. Here's a detached shock wave in front of that body. Here is our shock detachment distance delta. This shock detachment distance is critically dependent on the density ratio across the shock wave. As a matter of fact, at the bottom of page 513, you will see the approximate expression for the shock detachment distance in hypersonic flow. The shock detachment distance divided by the nose radius is the reciprocal of the density ratio across a shock wave. 
If we have a calorically perfect gas with gamma equals 1.6, this number is 6. <clears throat> but we just saw that at 36,000 feet per second, at about 300,000 feet, this ratio is about 19. And what does that tell you about the location of your shock wave? That tells you that if we look at figure 14.5, we have a shock wave standing out from this blunt nose body. If we don't, if, we, for if the gamma is equal 1.4 and we have no chemical reactions, the detachment distance is this. But if we allow chemical reactions to occur, and then the shock wave is closer to the body by a considerable distance. So the chemical reacting effects in a shock layer can have a tremendous impact on something as important as, say, the shock detachment distance in front of your body, in front of your nose. The same thing applies to oblique shock waves as well. Show you a picture, say, a flow over a wedge. This is figure 14.7. Looking at oblique shock waves, you have a shock wave here for gamma equals 1.4. If you have a chemically acting gas, the shock wave will lie closer to the surface. Because the density ratio across the wave will be higher, your shock wave lies closer to the surface, even for an oblique shock wave. OK, now, a couple of other comments. We're looking at pictures there having to do with equilibrium flows. There's a section in your book, page 527, section 14.5, deals with frozen and equilibrium flows. Whenever you're dealing with high temperature gas dynamics, you will always encounter these words. Equilibrium flow here, frozen flow there. Let's clarify what we mean by these things. Maybe a good way to clarify it is to look at page 528. Let's look at an example where we have, uh, say, chemical reacting flow expanding through a nozzle. As this flow expands through the nozzle, the temperature goes down. The temperature decreases. Now, two extremes can happen in terms of the chemical reactions. First of all, we can say that this flow is frozen flow. Now, frozen flow, by definition, means that there are no chemical reactions. So if we have a chemically frozen flow, then we have a, a reservoir of gas here, say oxygen at one atmosphere and 5,000 K, at these conditions, the oxygen is totally dissociated. And so the mass fraction, which is the mass of, speed of the oxygen per unit mass of mixture, the mass fraction of atomic oxygen is 1 because it's all atomic oxygen there. Now, if the flow is frozen, what that means is that the mass fraction of atomic oxygen stays the same throughout the whole nozzle flow because nothing happens. It's frozen flow. On the other hand, the other extreme, Let's say that we have local chemical equilibrium in this flow. Then, as the temperature goes down, the, we get colder regions of the flow. That means the oxygen is wanted to kind of recombine back into a a diatomic oxygen. And the mass fraction, we'll go back to this figure, the mass fraction of atomic oxygen decreases as a function of distance. This would be our equilibrium case. This is our frozen case. The temperatures are different in these two cases. Because for the equilibrium flow, the temperature is higher than for the frozen flow. Now, why would that be the case? Well, if we have frozen flow, the, we have all this chemical energy that's locked up in the atoms, and it stays locked up. But if we have equilibrium flow, the atoms are disappearing. The atomic, uh, diatomic species is coming into, into the flow. And that energy that was locked up is being released. That chemical energy is being released into the flow. What happens? The temperature is higher than for the frozen case. So you see the, you'll see these words frozen and equilibrium used all the time. And they kind of represent uh, a kind of extremes between what can happen between uh, chemically reacting flows. Now, let's go on. Let's talk a little bit about that. I'm going to skip over a lot of material that we would otherwise cover. I'd like to go to uh, one particularly kind of interesting case, still talking about equilibrium flows. I'd like to talk about equilibrium chemically acting flow over a blunt body. This starts on page 592. This is section 14.9, equilibrium blunt body flows. I just want to show you some results. By the way, at this stage, I should say that a lot of these results have been calculated by various people in the literature, and all the references that I, for the data that I've been showing you have been, are given in these figures. I just have been trying to save time by not referring to them. 
Now, let's look at some, for example, these were calculations made by Palmer out at NASA Ames. Now, we're looking at flow over a blunt nose body at Mach 20. If we, and the, what we're looking at here are density contours. Contours of constant density. Here's the body, here's the shock wave. Here's a result for a calorically perfect gas. We turn a switch, we make the calculation chemically reacting with local chemical equilibrium. What happens? The shock wave moves in closer to the body. The density levels are much higher. You can't see them on the monitor, but if you look carefully in your notes, these density levels are up to like 8.5, 10. These here, of course, are below 6 because it's a calorically perfect gas. The temperature levels, same thing. Here's the calorically perfect gas, and we see temperature ratios of like 45. But when we turn on the chemically acting effects, the shock wave moves closer to the body, and the temperatures are lower, maybe temperature levels like 25 or 32 at most. So this is characteristic of a chemically reacting flow over a blunt nose body. Now, I'd also like to uh, give you an example of a chemically reacting effect, effect in a hypersonic flow that I found very interesting. We're going to look at the uh, calculation of a flow field over the space shuttle. And in particular, we'll concentrate on the pressure distribution on the bottom surface of the space shuttle. Now, let's look at a calculation of the pressure distribution over the bottom surface of the space shuttle. This is a case where we're looking at pressure as a function of distance along the bottom surface of the space shuttle. And we have two sets of calculations made here, both of, both of them for Mach number 23. Space shuttle is at Mach number 23. It's a 30 degree angle of attack. One calculation is made here for calorically perfect gas with gamma equals 1.4, and those are the circles for the pressure distribution. Then the calculation is repeated for equilibrium air. Assuming local, local chemical equilibrium, chemical reacting flow along the surface of the space shuttle. And those are the triangles. Now, you look at those two sets of results, you say, there's not much difference. And there isn't much difference. And as a matter of fact, this is a perfect example of a more or less general result. It's not a cardinal principle, but it occurs a lot of times. Pressure is the least sensitive variable in a chemical reacting flow. Pressure is much more mechanically oriented much more mechanically determined from the momentum equation. It is least sensitive to chemical reacting effects. And that's not always true, but it's generally true. And, and especially, it is always true in flow fields involving compressions. And that's what we're talking about when we go through a shock wave. Now, so you look at these results and you say, gee, the pressure is very insensitive to the chemical reacting effects. That's interesting. That's nice. Why are we looking at this in the first place? Well, let's go back to the... Uh, space shuttle for a minute. The flight tests of the space shuttle have been reasonably successful in terms of providing aerodynamic data that agreed with the predictions before the shuttle ever flew. You know, in the, in the years during the design of the space shuttle, there was a major collection of wind tunnel data and some computations that were collected into a wind, uh, space shuttle aerodynamic data book. It's about this thick, you know, several inches thick. The aerodynamic predictions on the space shuttle agreed very well with the actual measured results, except in one case that I'm aware of anyway. And that is that the pilots on the space shuttle, when they came back through the atmosphere, had to trim the space shuttle by the deflection of a body flap, which is on the bottom of the surface. And they had to deflect that body flap a factor of two greater than was ever predicted. And what that meant was that the prediction of the moment coefficient, if we come back to the over, the prediction of the moment coefficient about the center of gravity of the space shuttle was wrong. Grossly wrong. Why? Why was it wrong? Well, let's go back to our pressure distribution here on the bottom surface of the space shuttle. The triangles are the chemical reacting case. The circles are the non-reacting gamma equals 1.4 results. Hardly any difference, but if you look carefully, the chemical reacting pressures are slightly higher up here in the nose region, and the chemical reacting pressures are slightly lower down near the tail region. How do you get a moment coefficient about the center of gravity? 
You take these pressures and you multiply them through big, long moment arms. And so, these small differences in pressures are magnified greatly when you go to calculate, multiply by the moment arms and calculate the moment coefficient. And if you look at the moment coefficient, figure 1427, we see a plot of moment coefficient versus angle of attack. And what do we see? The calorically perfect gas results are here. The equilibrium chemically reacting gas results are here. And this is, a no, this is a tremendous difference, and this is enough of a difference to account for that body flap deflection. Now, what we're looking at here is an effect of chemically reacting flow on a mundane problem, as mundane and pedestrian, quote, unquote, as the calculation of a moment coefficient on a flight vehicle. And here's another example of the importance of high temperature flow effects in high temperature, in hypersonic flow. It's something as fundamentally aerodynamic as a moment coefficient, a pitching moment coefficient, is being influenced by the high temperature effects. So, okay, now, that's what, you've seen some examples of high temperature flows, normal shock flows and shuttle flows and so forth, blown body flows, where we're assuming local chemical equilibrium. Let's spend the rest of our time talking a little bit about high temperature non-equilibrium flows. And where are we on our, on, our, uh, uh, on our road map? Well, I've even buried our road map, and for good reason, because we're kind of, uh, we're kind of lost back. Uh, I'm trying to get from Washington to Chicago, and we're about Dayton, Ohio right now. But we're going to take our last 15 minutes and talk a little bit about non-equilibrium flows, because these are important. What do we mean by a non-equilibrium flow? Uh, Let's look at some definitions again. We've already talked about a frozen flow, a frozen flow. Let me redefine what a frozen flow really is. If you have a flow field, and you have a chemical reacting flow field, and you say that flow is frozen, that means there are no chemical reactions taking place. What you are really saying is that the reaction rate constants are zero. And if we, have re if we have vibrational relaxation, it means the relaxation time is infinitely large. In turn, when we define an equilibrium flow, an equilibrium flow is one where the chemistry is instantaneously adjusting at every point in the flow field. And this means to have a truly, truly speaking, to have a flow, an equilibrium flow, you have to have an infinite reaction rate constant or a zero relaxation time. So what this says is the following. In real life, you never have a truly frozen flow. And in real life, you never have a truly e equilibrium flow. These things do not exist in nature. But there are plenty of flow problems where, and high temperature flow problems where the actual flow problem is so close to being, say, a frozen flow where you can make that assumption. Or, on another hand, the flow problem is so close to being an equilibrium flow you can make the assumption of an equilibrium flow. Now, this is very much analogous. You know, when, when you deal in a first course in compressible flow or thermodynamics, and we talk about isentropic flows, constant entropy flows, there is no such thing. There's no such thing in real life as an isentropic flow. But there are plenty of examples where real-life flow problems are close enough to being isentropic that you can get away with that assumption. Over here across the parking lot, we have a supersonic wind tunnel in the laboratory. You turn that flow on, and that flow is pretty isentropic through that, the nozzle, anyway, of the supersonic wind tunnel. But it's not exactly. But we make that assumption, and we pull out our compressible flow tables uh, for isentropic flows, and we make calculations all the time, and they're good calculations. I'm saying there's a direct parallel here that in high temperature gas dynamics and high temperature hypersonic flows, there are some times, and we'll go back to the overhead camera, there are some times where the actual flows are so close to being a frozen flow, you can make this assumption and you make your calculations accordingly. There are other times when the flow is so close to an equilibrium flow that you can make that assumption and you make your calculations accordingly. Okay, but what now what happens in between? What about those situations that are neither frozen flow or equilibrium flow? And as a matter of fact, let's even ask a more fundamental question. How can you, you can even ascertain whether or not you have a given, in your given flow field, the flow is either frozen or equilibrium or somewhere in between. 
And the answer to that is, is this. Let's, uh, let's go up and we'll uh, even stand up to do this. Let's, let's imagine that we're looking at the hypersonic flow over this pen. Okay? Hypersonic flow over this pen. And it's a high temperature chemically reacting flow. Now, the, it's going to take a certain characteristic time for those chemical reactions to occur. And in our thought experiment here a few minutes ago where we took the air in this room, we heated up to 5,000 K, uh, the, uh, I said in the first few milliseconds, dissociation occurred. Well, those first two or three milliseconds, that's the chemistry time. Chemistry time. It takes three milliseconds, say, for the dissociation to occur. That's the chemistry time. And they say we know that somehow or another. Okay, let's go back to our flow problem. The chemistry time now is three milliseconds. Okay, well, let's say that we have a, let's visualize a fluid element flowing past this pen. And let's say that it's flowing past this pen, and maybe it might take a second to go past this pen. Now that second is what we can call the flow time. The flow time is one second. It takes the fluid element one second to go past this pen. But the chemistry is all happening in like two or three milliseconds. Chemistry time is much, much slower, shorter. So what that means is, as this fluid element sort of wanders across the pen, the chemistry is taking place so fast that there's plenty of time for this local adjustment, and the flow field is very close to what you would have under the assumption of local chemical equilibrium and all the stuff we just finished talking about. That's the case when the chemistry time is much smaller than the flow time. And that's the criteria you use to judge that you have an equilibrium flow. Now let's look at another example. Let, let's say that the flow, the fluid element is zipping past this pen. Let's say the flow is zip, it zips past this pen in one microsecond. So the fluid element takes one microsecond to flow past the pen. Now the chemistry is taking three milliseconds to occur. So that means that the fluid element is way down here, is probably about three blocks away before the fluid element wakes up and says, my gosh, I've got to have some chemical reactions occur here. And that's a situation where the flow is basically frozen. And that is a situation where the chemistry time is much larger than the flow time. And so this is the kind of criteria that you would use to judge in your chemically reacting hypersonic flow whether or not you have, we'll come back to the overhead now, whether or not we have frozen flow or whether we have an equilibrium flow, or whether we have something in between. And in particular, we'll read these statements. We can assume local equilibrium flow if the flow time is much, much greater than the chemistry time. We can assume frozen flow if the flow time is much, much less than the chemistry time. And for all other cases, the flow is non-equilibrium. And when you have a non-equilibrium flow, then you have to worry about the finite rate processes that are taking place. You have to worry about carrying along in your calculations these rate equations for the chemistry and for the vibrational non-equilibrium <laughs> and so on and so forth. Now, in the five minutes that we have left, let me give you some very quick examples as to what non-equilibrium effects do to your flow field. And one of the best ways of showing this, I think, is to look at a shock wave, a normal shock wave again. So we're here at page 556. And we're looking at flow through a shock wave. But now it's going to be chemical equilibrium flow, sorry, chemical non-equilibrium flow through the shock wave. And what this means is as, is as follows, that the flow goes through the shock front. And as the flow moves downstream of the shock wave, chemical reactions will start to, to occur. But they don't occur instantaneously. They will start to occur. And in particular, if we look at figure 15.4, we'll see a variation of chemical species as a function of distance behind the shock wave itself. So the species will vary as a function of distance behind the shock wave. Let me go back and recast this problem a little bit now that we've seen that. Let's just look at the shock front itself. This is, I've been, in fact, I call this a shock front, front for a specific reason. This is the 
This is a distance that's a very thin distance. This distance is usually a few mean free paths thick. This is the distance over which the translational energy, the translational motion of the gas is very quickly equilibrating to new conditions. This is the region in which viscosity and thermal conduction are having the strongest effect. This is a few mean free paths thick based on the upstream flow. Now, a few mean free paths thick, that means only a few molecular collisions occur in going through the shock front. If only two or three molecular or four or five molecular collisions occur, are we going to get any chemical reactions? Chemical reactions typically take hundreds of, th of thousands of molecular collisions to occur before, say, a dissociation starts to occur. And if we only have three or four molecular collisions, we don't have any chemical reactions through the shock front. What that means is that the flow right behind the shock front is frozen flow. If we would look at the mass fraction of atomic nitrogen, and let's say it's given by this level right here, let's say that's essentially zero. The mass fraction of the atomic nitrogen in front of the shock is equal to the mass fraction of the atomic nitrogen behind the shock. And then only after a certain distance downstream will the, will, will the chemistry have time to begin to dissociate. So we have a shock front, and then we have this variation behind the shock front, which is the region in which dissociation is occurring. If we go back and we look at our, our mass fraction, or in this case, our mole fraction, our species concentration distributions, what do we see? This is a, these are results from an actual calculation with a Mach number 12 in front of the shock wave, 300 degrees in front of the shock. And we see behind the shock wave, for example, the dissociation of oxygen taking place, the o oxy atomic oxygen coming up. We see the atomic nitrogen coming up. We see nitric oxide being produced in this, in this non-equilibrium region. And here's an interesting point. I said a moment ago that we have two extremes, frozen flow and equilibrium flow. And then you have everything in between as non-equilibrium flow. That does not necessarily mean that the frozen conditions or the equilibrium conditions represent two bounds, two extreme bounds on the, on the non-equilibrium flow because let's look at the nitric oxide production. The nitric oxide starts out down at zero behind the shock. That's the frozen flow behind, across the shock front because there isn't any nitric oxide in front of the shock. So it starts out at zero. Zero is the frozen flow value. The equilibrium flow value for nitrogen is given by this little dashed line right there, for nitric oxide, that is. It's given by that dashed line. What we see here is the nitric oxide increases, reaches a local peak, and then decreases. So the nitric oxide actually overshoots. And you see this always in hypersonic flow problems dealing with high temperature air. You will see nitric, over, nitric oxide overshoots behind strong shock waves. And thus, so this is outside the bounds of either the equilibrium or the frozen conditions. And so what I'm saying here is that when you have a non-equilibrium flow, the frozen flow and the equilibrium flow don't always represent the extreme bounds. Now, one can do this for all kinds of flow fields. You can look at nozzle flows. We can look at non-equilibrium flows over blunt bodies. A lot of these results are in the book that you have in front of you, and we're out of time talking about them. We're also out of time to talk about high-temperature uh, high chemically reacting viscous flows, which have very interesting properties associated with them. And these are things which I'm going to just have to leave you to read at your convenience uh, for your interest. And I'll, just the final comment that I'll make is keep in mind what we've done today. I've tried to explain to you some basic physical phenomena associated with all kinds of different kinds of hi hypersonic flows. We've tossed out lots of definitions, lots of terms, lots of thoughts, lots of ideas. And I'll repeat again, if you feel a little bit blown out of the water by these, keep in mind that we cover all this material in a one-year graduate sequence at the University of Maryland. So don't feel badly if in the space of five hours we feel like you've been squeezed a bit. But what I've tried to accomplish is to give you a little bit of insight, a little bit of feeling, so as you can come in tomorrow morning and listen in a little more sophisticated way to some of the applications associated with hypersonic flow. And if you, if you feel a little more comfortable about some of these ideas about hypersonic flow, then we've achieved that intermediate goal. And then remember what our final goal is, that tomorrow afternoon when you walk outside the door or wherever you are and you leave the, the course,
by tomorrow afternoon at 5 o'clock. Hopefully, you will be able to pick up a paper in the AIAA journal or wherever on hypersonic aerodynamics or hypersonic propulsion. Look at that paper and see things in that paper that you never saw before because you've had some benefit to think about them here in this course. So again, that's our objective, and uh, we will continue to tr strive to achieve that objective. We will start tomorrow again at 11 o'clock tomorrow morning and begin with some discussion on uh, applications. So I hope everybody has a pleasant evening, and we'll see you tomorrow morning.